But the thing is, I wasn't really trying to reach vegans with the non-vegan message. You know, with, I wasn't trying to reach vegans. I was talking about practices we were doing to animals. You know, vegans already knew that. So I learned that it's less sustainable because you're always fighting. Okay, it's less inviting. It's it's a, it's not a helpful way to communicate. It's not an effective way to communicate because if you're communicating about any other thing, like oh, that, like just say accounting. And you're being aggressive and yelling at someone. <laughs> was, like, why would you communicate like that with any, anything else? But I, I understand that this is just such a hot topic, for, and it's a very it's something I was very passionate about. But I learned now that aggression is anger in action. Okay, so anger is a helpful emotion. Okay, uh, anger can help you get off your butt and do something. But the second you act out your anger, it becomes aggression. It's not helpful. It's not helpful. And I learned that now, I reach so many more people now. People can sit down with their families. I was swearing every second sentence, uh, or every second word. I remember James Aspie said to me, he said, um, the truth is powerful enough, okay? What's happening to animals is powerful enough. You don't have to swear every two seconds. And it's so true, it's so true. So I found like that talking to people like they're your friend really helps, okay? It just uh, gets them to pull their guard down a bit, you know? It's not us against them. You know, you didn't know a couple of years back too. So talking to people like they're your friend, hey bro, hey mate, uh, you know, I, I was there once too, really helps. Now, who knows what the most effective form of activism is, except for those who were at my talk last <laughs> night, or who've already seen my talk. Who knows the most effective form of activism? Okay, the most, well, I'll, just, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the most effective form of activism is the form of activism you're best at, basically. So whatever skill set you possess, okay, that's the beauty of a uh, movement with such diversity. So people get scared off when I talk about activism. They, they have this you know, picture in their mind of what they think it is. It's signs, it's screaming meat is murder at people with blood all over you, it's stopping slaughterhouse trucks. These are forms of activism, but they're not the only forms of activism. And it's about being proactive, okay? It's about utilising the skills you already possess. Everyone's got different skills and we should be uh, utilising the ones that you're best at. You know, everyone's got talents, don't they? Some people are good at public speaking, some people are good hairdressers, some people are good cooks. Okay, you wouldn't have the cook out there public speaking or the public speaking doing someone's hair because I'll mess it up. Okay? Mm. Now, there's many different things you can do. Okay, you could be organising behind the scenes because some activists need people to organise for them. You've got front men speakers or front women speakers that, that get up there on the stage and, you know, pick someone to organise the events. They, the, the speaker doesn't organise the event. So everything works together. Is what I'm saying. So don't feel inadequate if you're doing something that's not, you know, what James Aspie does, because he's got someone behind the scenes helping him do what he does. You know, organising his events that he he can't possibly keep up with all that work. But he used to for about a year. He was doing it for a couple of years. He did it all by himself. But the the thing I'm trying to get through to people is that you have to be creative and and put something into the movement that you're best at. Okay. Think about what that is, and we need you now. Okay, I'll talk about uh, something that I think is really effective, and that's making videos. I'll tell you exactly why. Uh, Gary Rosky, uh, public speaker, uh, vegan educator, he did around 2,000 talks to around 50,000 students over the course of his career. Okay, uh, a lot of mental, physical, emotional, you know, stress going into like meat capital, meat eating capitals, Texas talking into talking to universities full of uh, kids giving him, you know, the same repetitive excuses over and over again. But his Georgia Tech speech got filmed, okay, from the, someone from the crowd, a vegan from the crowd actually filmed it, he, they didn't tell him about it, he didn't really know about it, and it got posted on YouTube, okay, that speech has now gone viral, okay, it reached three and a half million on just one channel, it's been uploaded to many other channels, reached millions, it's been uploaded uh, small snippets to Facebook, uh, through social media, Gary Roski went viral, okay, now he's still going viral, people are still making little Facebook videos that are getting millions of views. Now, the point is, that if he just, uh, Social media and videos weren't utilised. Uh, no one would know who he was, who he is. Okay, none of us would. They would, would have basically fallen on the ears of those who were in the university. Okay. Now this is the power of videos. Without social media, basically, there is no movement that like there is now. Okay. You've got a few people here and there handing out pamphlets. Okay. Which is you know it's still activism, but the the point is, without social media, we would not have this exponential growth that we're seeing now. Uh, obviously, this is what um, how I've reached so many people. Okay, through my videos, reaching millions now, millions of people through Facebook. I'm utilising that platform now, and I think that's what 
I think it was a Facebook video that got most of the BBC, um, you know, interest. It might have been the, the, the one that went viral with the two police um, at a vigil. So, social media is a very powerful tool. Making videos is a very powerful tool. If you feel like you, you want to do that, you don't even have to be in your own video. You can edit things together without even being in it, if that's not you. Uh, you can, if you feel like you can talk in front of the camera, if you feel like you can write a script and make a really powerful, punchy uh, Facebook video with some subtitles with a really catchy thumbnail. When, you, when you're when you calling your video something, don't call it, oh, uh, August 11th, 2018, <laughs> activism. Don't call it that, you know, find something in the video that was, you know, potentially interest, something <coughs> potentially interesting, and you have to sort of, you know, make it watchable. Our mind's always vegan versus meat eater, you know, best debate ever, or something like that. You know, because people want to see it, you know, I, pre I prefer not to do that. Of course, I prefer to just say, amazing discussion, turned out really well, really great, you know. <laughs> or, he was a bit nasty, but I was really polite to him. <laughs> but I have to capitalise, like, people don't want to see that, do they? They want to see me going at someone, and it's just, it's human nature. So, capitalise on that. Okay, it's for the animals at the end of the day. What you call it, like when they see my co conduct in the video, it's nothing like what I, what I make it out to be in the thumbnail and the title. This is all part of the game. Okay? Trying to get people to watch so they get the strong animal rights message. So think about that. Think about that. I see people make mistakes. They've got an excellent video. You could have the best video on earth. It took you three weeks to edit. And your, your title and thumbnail could be way off. Okay? You get 50 views. You could have the crappiest video you've ever made. Amazing thumbnail, real clickbait title, get a million views. Okay? This is, that's probably one of the most stressful things for me is making a, a title and a thumbnail. <laughs> me and James would bring each other like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> 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 really intense. Really intense. Alright. So I want to talk to you a little bit about a couple of forms of activism that I find really fulfilling and really effective. Um, you don't have to do these forms of activism. Like I said, activism means many different things. I'm just, I just really like these two types, and I'll start with Anonymous for the Voiceless. Does anyone not know what Anonymous for the Voiceless is here? Sometimes people don't. Okay, so we don't have to go through that with you. Uh, last night I gave some people some outreach tips. Okay, we did, we did a bit of that, and this is going to be very similar, uh, pretty much the same. The first massive tip, for those of you who didn't hear last night, is uh, building rapport. Okay, now this is something that comes quite naturally to me, but sometimes I just completely forget about it. I do, but you have to be super conscious of it. Okay, sometimes I'm really that in a moment that I forget about building rapport. Okay, and it's basically like someone's walking up and you go, okay, so what type, what type of person is this? Okay, they're really placid. Are they an elderly lady? Do they have kids? Do they have some dogs there? Is he a real staunch guy and he's really abrupt with a, with a uh, full on energy? Are they a bunch of 15 year old uh, you know, boys that you know, think they're pretty cool? So you analyse that and you talk accordingly. You sort of be like a chameleon and you, and you sort of mimic some of their body language, maybe some of the way that they're, they're speaking. You know, if you see s some young dudes, don't talk down to them like you're their teacher because that's not how you connect with someone, okay? They're just going to think you're, you know, their teacher, you're trying to tell them what to do. Speak to them on their level, hey, go on, bro, have you seen this before? It's pretty messed up, hey? If they start swearing, drop a little swear word here and there, they go, wow, it's like me, you know? I do it all the time, so I edit those parts out. Sometimes I'm... <laughs> supermarket and you're talking to like an elderly lady, you'd be like, hello, how are you? Oh, how's your day? You know, same thing with vegan outreach, so don't forget that. Um, building rapport, body language, all that stuff. Tony Robbins does a really good uh, seminar on building rapport, you could watch that. Um, but yeah, it comes naturally to some people, some people have to, you know, just be a little bit more mindful of it. Also, it's about understanding the person you're talking to, okay? Now, i tell a story about um, Devin Kause, a uh, farmer. That video, the Devin Kause video actually went viral, on, or nearly went viral on Facebook, 800,000 views. Okay, now this guy in a tractor, blue tractor, wouldn't stop his tractor. Who's seen the video? Yeah, yeah most people seen it. Um, so basically, the farmer was really upset, and he, he didn't want to stop, because he, when he came back, he told us that we were making it harder for him than it already was. Was you know we're making it hard for him. He didn't want to send his cow to the slaughterhouse, and you know basically we we're having this emotional discussion. I could see the emotion in his eyes. He was tearing up a bit, 
and I kept it in emotion, and I was pulling it out of him, and I was saying, listen, mate, you know, you don't have to do this, what, you know, you're a good person, you know your cows, they're sentient, you know how intelligent they are, they don't want to die, this is not the only way. And someone behind me started talking about statistics, and, you know, the amount of crops it takes to, to, to feed a cow, to make them really, anyway, he sent him off track, so he took it out of his heart and into his head, and that's not where I wanted it. Okay, so I turned around and said, excuse me, can you let me take this? Now, if anyone's doing outreach with me and I do that, it's because I'm trying to get someone with someone. You should always let um, one individual at a time talk to someone because and, and, otherwise you can send someone off track. And this is what happened in this situation. And I kept it back in his heart, okay, because I was getting somewhere. Now, the point I'm trying to make is if you find an empath that is really emotional about what they're seeing on the screen, of like, wow, you know, I care about animals or do you care about animals? Keep it there. They care about animals. You've got them. Now, you keep, you keep working it there. Well, if you care about animals, you know, your actions have to be consistent with that. And I, I know you care about animals. You seem like you care about animals, but, you know, your actions don't reflect that. If they're a logic <coughs> robot, okay, you can win an argument on veganism on pure logic alone. You don't have to bring emotion into it, okay? It's an illogical position, kindism. There's, there's contradictions everywhere, and it's so easy to point out once you see them. Um, so pure logic alone, but I always try to bring it to people's heart. Because if you get people to use their heart, they're, they're more likely to use it in the future. Okay, this is how we create a more peace, uh, peaceful, altruistic world. Um, the toughest guys on the earth, you know, always try to find someone else for, or an animal they care about. And there usually is. Okay, and you can always try to get them to put their, that animal in the same position as a pig. And, you know, you can usually get something out of them. People who say they don't care, I always question that. Because it's usually a defense mechanism. I don't believe that they don't care. Because I say, oh, well, what do you what do you care about? You don't care about anyone else but yourself. So you can usually get that out of them. I, I don't I don't accept it when someone says they just don't care. Okay. So be be uh, mindful of that. Also, having info and resources on you. We always have our cards on us. We just got another thousand printed. The cards are uh, concise. Keep them concise. Would be my advice. A couple of things on ethics. A couple of things on health, a couple of things on environment. Turn it around. You should always have a resource for them to go vegan and get um, mentored. Okay, I use Challenge 22. You can start your own, or you can use Vegan Easy or Veganuero. Veganuero, I think it is. Um, we have them on us not just when we're doing Anonymous for the Voiceless. We have them when we go anywhere and do anything. Okay, because it's better than going, watch this, you've got to watch that, you've got to watch this. You say, here's a card, check them out on the back. If you're interested, you can try to do a challenge, vegan challenge. The reason I use Challenge 22 is because I'm, I'm aware that veganism is not a challenge, obviously, but if you can get someone to commit for a few weeks, you know, then they're like, wow, I like the food, I had this vegan donut, wow, it wasn't that hard, you know, I feel like not backed up anymore, my mind's clear. They've tried it out, you know, they've realised they can do it, and once they, they've realised they can do it, they have one less excuse, okay, and that's what we're trying to do, knock out the excuses. When they know it's doable, when they see what's going on with animals, they've watched Cowspiracy and what the hell, bang, you know, you've... you've You've nearly got them there. So th this is just raising the uh, probability of them staying vegan. Okay. The power of showing slaughterhouse footage. Uh, obviously, it's the most powerful thing you can do. So people make up this story in their mind what they think is in a slaughterhouse. I don't know where the story comes from. Uh, propaganda, probably. You know, the, the humane milk carton with the green pastures. But showing someone what happens in a slaughterhouse, uh, footage just doesn't lie. It's right there. You know, it's, it's a lot harder for people to argue with you, I found, when they're looking at a screen with something really horrific going on in it. They, 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 they don't really whip out the excuses as much, but you find that in the conversation without the slaughterhouse footage there, they're more likely to go, oh, it's humane, it's this and that, and they start whipping out these excuses. But there's a small discrepancy with slaughterhouse footage, which I always tell people who are going to be doing the outreach, because it's usually uh, animal cruelty on the screen or something, you know, some type of slaughterhouse practice. They could go, oh, well, that's that particular slaughterhouse, that's fine, that's not where I get my meat from, I get my meat from my humane butcher down the road, and they do it completely different to that. Or they might say, you know, oh, luckily I get free range eggs and organic milk, and oh, or, or, or they'll say, that's pretty bad, but it could be done better. Okay? Now, this is welfareist ideology, and this is not abolitionist vegan, um, what we are promoting. Okay? We, we don't want... Uh, to find a better way to enslave someone. We don't want to find a better way to kill someone. Okay, this is this is absurd. Okay, so do not entertain that with them. It's up to you as an outreacher to take it away from treatment, which is what you're seeing on the screen, treatment, and it, you bring it into animal use. We shouldn't be using them. Okay, there's no humane way to use or exploit someone. Okay, and that's up to you. There's no humane way to take anyone's life, and you will know that. So that's where you bring it to. 
Okay, that's up to you. Otherwise, you let, you let them lead with a welfareist message in your mind, you haven't done your, your job, essentially. Okay, because they're still going to find a way to justify eating animal products, they're just going to find humane ways to do it, which don't, which don't exist, basically. So be very mindful of that. Very mindful of that. <coughs> also, remain polite and respectful as far as you can. I mean, I don't always remain calm. I uh, did a TV, what was it, radio uh, thing the other day, Jeremy Vine, and I got a little bit worked up. I did. Um, in retrospect, I probably could have stayed a little bit more calmer and still said exactly the same things that I said. But I'm only human. You know, I'm only human and, you know, like sometimes it does get to me. And I really wanted to take that opportunity to, you know, let them understand my point of view. But I felt like maybe I was a little bit abrupt. But I was still polite, still respectful. I didn't swear. I, didn't, I, wasn't, I didn't feel like I was rude, even though some people said I was rude. I was just passionate. My passion is misconstrued as anger. But... So I don't always say keep calm because sometimes you can you're just raising to the level of the conversation. There might be a really intense conversation. If you bring it up a little bit, it can really help. You know, some people like that intensity, but you should always remain polite and respectful. Okay, you know, and I would never ask you to respect someone's choice to eat animal products or use animals. I would never ask you to respect that choice, but you should show them respect because it was a time when you didn't know. Okay, now people ask me, Joey. Uh, you know, I'm a, uh, I eat meat. Do you res do you respect that? Can you respect my choice? And I say no. I cannot respect your choice to consume animals, to consume my friends. But I do respect you. Okay, and I will show you respect. But I'll never respect that choice. And I've never heard someone get offended by that. Okay, because you're not showing them disrespect. It's their action that you don't respect. Okay, I've I've had friends in the past that I didn't respect what they did, but I still they were still my friend. You know, you're like, why'd you do that? That was, a, that was a silly action. It was an unconscious action. You shouldn't have done that. But I still love you, mate. Okay, this is the, this is the type of attitude we need to have towards this because this is how we, um, we connect with people. Okay, we want them to understand, hey, you know, we don't think you're a bad person. You know, I wasn't vegan my whole life either. I was a lot far, very far from it myself. So I'm not here to be superior. Okay. Also, everyone you talk to is very unique. Just remember that, very, very, very unique in the, in the things that make them tick, okay? So ethics is, uh, I, I really want to get people to understand the ethics. I think that that is irrefutable. That point cannot be refuted unless they admit that they'd like the same treatment for their loved one, a pet, or themselves, okay? Otherwise, they're just a massive hypocrite. So that, the ethics point cannot be refuted. It's the strongest argument we have. Okay. Health, oh, there's conflicting studies here funded by the egg industry, but, you know, environment, oh, there's conflicting studies here and that, but, you know, they, they are powerful points to make, but ethics cannot be refuted unless they admit that they're a massive uh, hypocrite, okay? Because they're, 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 they're saying it's okay for other beings, but not okay for themselves. It's okay for these animals, but not okay for their own animal. Okay, this is pure hypocrisy, it's easy to point out. This is why I always go to ethics, but, you know, they might be interested in their health and that might really put the icing on the vegan cake for, for you, you know, like they find, out, they find out about heart disease, about, you know, uh, cancer, about the, uh, type 2 diabetes and all of these things that they're really into the environment, you know, you use that. You let the, you feel out the conversation and see where it goes. You leave, you know, little hints here and there and see where it goes, okay? Uh, just be, be quite aware of who you're talking to. Also, if you're not involved with uh, any type of vegan out outreach, get involved. It's very fulfilling, okay? Sometimes you can feel isolated, you know, people, your family won't listen to you, you know, if your friends might not be wanting to take the message on and you're really trying with someone and you've been trying for ages and you're just not, they're just not budging. You go out and do some vegan outreach, okay? It's the most fulfilling thing when you, you find someone who's really interested because they stop, especially anonymous for the voiceless type outreach, they stop because they're interested, okay? So half the work's been done for you, all right? And then you have a really positive conversation with this person, they take a card, they, they sign up to Challenge 22 or something like that, bang, fulfillment. Okay, you've just got fulfillment out of your activism. It's an amazing, amazing, uh, fulfilling type of activism, vegan outreach. Talk about Socratic uh, method. Um, Socratic method is basically the, the art of teaching people by asking questions. I didn't know who Socrates was, I didn't know what Socratic method meant. I was doing it though, and someone actually told me what it was in my comment section. And I was like, okay, cool. So I looked it up and I was like, oh yeah, well I'm doing that. But basically, <laughs> basically it's just um, asking questions. Okay, and if you could try to do, when you're on vegan outreach, try to uh, navigate a whole conversation with just questions. 
Okay, see if you can do that. Okay, everything they say, respond with a question. Okay, yeah, yeah, but my animal's a cute humane. Is there a humane way to kill someone who doesn't want to die? Oh, yeah, there is. Okay, is there a humane way to kill your dog if they don't want to die? Oh, not my dog, I love my dog. So what's the difference between your dog and a pig? Oh, well, you know, my, my, my dog's really smart. My pig's not smart. Like, so you're always asking them questions, or even if you're just asking in a curious fashion, basically, and you navigate them to the vegan conclusion, and it's the least intrusive way to do this, and you can watch someone's conditioning unravel right before your eyes, and it's like magic. You, just, you, you, you cannot explain it. You can just see them going. And once you've got them there, once you've got them there, they pause, they might not know what to say. Bang, give them a card. You know, thanks, thanks for your time. You know, check this out. You seem like a really smart, logical individual. I'm sure you can navigate, navigate yourself through the logic. I'll see you next time. And that's it. So, Socratic method. A lot of great activists do it. I think Ed does it. Uh, James Aspie does it. Even Gary Rosky does it in his speeches while he's doing his speech. He will ask a really powerful, heavy hitting question, and then he might answer it. But he'll, he'll give him a second to think about it. You know, asking questions because you want you want people to think for themselves. You know, you don't want like the TV does all the thinking for them. The, you know, the, the teachers, their parents have all done all the thinking for them. You want them to have critical thought. So the way that you you know get that going is by asking a question. It gets them to because you can pump information down someone's throat and they can just switch off so quickly. Like you'd never believe. Like if you've been talking to someone before who knows heaps about a certain topic and you just like bang, switched off, you're gone. Like, and they're still talking, but there's not just white noise, and just like waiting for them to stop. So that, that can happen, and remember, you're a lot more interested in this than they might be, so they can just, then you've lost them. If you ask them a question, like, shit, they just asked me a question, then they engage. They have a thought process, boom, they engage. So just remember that, ask them questions, even pepper your outreach. You know, so if you're explaining the egg industry, explain the egg industry, then ask them a question. Explain certain practice, ask them a question. Explain and ask. So a little bit of both is good too. Also, sometimes someone's going to say something hurtful, they might wave a ham sandwich in your face and try to rail you up on, in front of 7 million people on radio. <laughs> <laughs> but, you got the last laugh, Joy. Yeah. <laughs> so what you do in that situation is, don't let your emotions run the conversation. Now you respond, you don't react, okay? So obviously I don't always take my own advice, sometimes I, you know, I just, like I said, we're all human beings, but... Be more aware of it, try to be aware of it, especially when sometimes when you least expect it, you, you know, your passion can just override into like anger and then you let anger run the conversation, it can turn into an argument. But if you let the emotion come, you feel it, you go, okay, I'm aware of that, I'm not going to let this run the conversation, you let it pass, and then you respond. And when you respond to someone who said something hurtful to you, you respond with a question. Okay? Oh, okay. So you say something really smart, really clever with a question, politely and respectfully, and get them to think about it. And you know, doing the Socratic method can bring down an argument too. Because when you get, when you ask someone a question and they're angry, you get them to stop and think and cool down, and then, you know, so it really helps any, any uh, situation. So, another amazing form of activism I'm going to talk about is the SAVE movement. Anyone here not know what the SAVE movement is? Because is? sometimes there's people just don't know. Okay, so the SAVE movement is, we all know what it is, but it's the most powerful form of activism I've ever done, bar none. Um, bearing witness to animals. Uh, I used to speak up for animals before I, did, uh, before I met them, okay, because I just, I'd seen what was happening to them on the screens and I thought this is an injustice on a massive scale. I understood the injustice and I still spoke for them. And I still spoke with conviction, but nothing like I do now, you know, because I've been there with them, I've suffered with them, I've looked into their eyes, I've seen them on those trucks, you know, like an exploited uh, sow pig that had just been exploited her whole life, had piglets taken off of her. You know, you can see the sadness in their eyes, especially the older the animal, they've lived with suffering long, longer. And the only thing they've got look, to look forward to is a gas chamber or, you know, an electric shock and a knife across the throat. Um, chickens, you see the chickens 42 days old, six weeks old, just broken legs because of their, they're too big to support their own body weight broken wings because they've just been thrown into crates and crammed onto trucks, filled with feces and urine, just so scared and timid. The only sunlight they'll ever see in their life is on a truck on the way to be slaughtered. Very, very sad thing to witness. <coughs> but in that moment, you realise that it's not about you, okay? So that is a very powerful thing to realise. Wait a second, this isn't about me. Who's doing it that little bit harder? That's right, they are. 
Okay, they're doing it harder. And you might think, oh, Joel, you know, I can't go and bear witness. It's, it's, it's too emotional for me. I can't do that. But you'll be very surprised because something overcomes you in that moment. Something overcomes you. And I've never seen anyone freak out to the point where they can't do it. Just, I just haven't seen it. Okay, because you, you gain immediate perspective when you're there. Immediate perspective. Wow, those feelings that I've got in my stomach, that's nothing compared to what they're going through. Nothing. So don't even entertain that. There's, they are the ones in that truck, prison, in prison for their whole life, about to have their throats slashed open. This isn't about us. It's about them. Okay? And this is the perspective that I have. And I speak with that much conviction for animals now that people can feel it. Okay? People can feel it in my speeches when I'm talking about it. I've been there with them. Okay? Also, sometimes it's the, the only human compassion these animals will see in, the, in their entire life. Okay? It's from vegans out the front of slaughterhouses. Okay? Um, it's a good opportunity to say, you know, I see you, you know, we're trying, and we're sorry. A lot of people here, you know, I don't think anyone here has been vegan their whole life. Anyone here been vegan their whole life? Okay, so we've all consumed animals or animal products, so we've all contributed to what they're going through. So I think the least we could do is go and bear witness to them. Okay? Now, uh, hopefully you guys are going to get some type of SAG movement happening here. Uh, Clifford might be organising something, but I think you should all get together and organise regular SAGs, because... The, the power that it gives your activism, it, it works so well with vegan outreach, okay, talking to people after you've been, you've gone and bear witness to some pigs and showing them pictures, hey, you know, this is potentially the, the bacon that you're eating, this face here, just around this local area, we're only 30 minutes away, okay, showing someone that, that's so powerful, so powerful, and people used to say to me, hey, Joey, you know, what are you doing out in front of the slaughterhouse with a sign, that's not going to do nothing, uh, save movement doesn't do anything. Now, 30 years ago, that might be true. It might, might have had a little, very little effect. Just three people standing out there with a sign and that was it. You know, but it's still something. They're still doing something. I would never say, don't do that. They're still trying. But these days, we've got something called iPhones. So there's a little window uh, to an audience. Okay? So you, let's just say we've got 20 people at a, at a vigil. Okay? Or each of those people got 1,000 uh, face, uh, Facebook friends or whatever, followers. So you've got essentially, you know, potentially... 20,000 people out of that slaughterhouse. How are you supposed to get 20,000 people out to a slaughterhouse? You just couldn't. Can't even get your non-vegan friend to come to a vegan restaurant with you. <laughs> but you can with these devices now. Okay, so this is the power of the SAVE movement. And if you've got one in every city and every country on Earth, we're essentially bringing to light what's done, done in the dark. Okay, we're showing the public the faces of their food before it's slaughtered. Okay, nothing... There's nothing as powerful as this other than showing people what happens inside of there, than showing them, you know, animals on the way in. Okay, they go, wow, can I, I'm connecting the dots here. Some activists even uh, go as far as getting the serial number to the slaughterhouse, and, and so the packaged dead animals in Tesco's and Sainsbury's will have a particular number on it, and they, they connect it to the same slaughterhouse. And they go, okay, these are the live animals that we did the vigil at the other day. This is the, the from the same slaughterhouse, so this is the face of them alive, and this is the supermarket selling their dead flesh. So it's even another connection, an even more powerful connection. So this is the type of things that the SAVE movement um, is good for and why it's so effective. And I highly recommend you getting involved, okay? I really do. Now, anyone can do this. So no matter what type of personality you got, everyone can do this. It's not like something really hectic that's gonna scar you for life. It's just some animals, they're just in a truck, you just peek your phone in, Peek your head in, have a look, and you know, share the share the pictures. Sharing the pictures is the most powerful part. It really is. Also, it builds solidarity between um, vegans and other activists. It really does, because you realise, hey, we're all in this together. This is what we're fighting for, <laughs> and it gives you um, time to you know be there for each other, offer each other support, because it can be a very sad experience. But you know, don't be afraid to express normal emotion, because it's a very horrific thing. And you, you know, we're only human beings. We should all be there for each other. So, if something does start up here, I'm pretty sure that it potentially will, okay? Get, him, get onto Clifford and do something together. Okay, now, I want to talk about getting over the fear of doing activism. This talk is called Fearless Activism. Now, I'm very well aware that there is some fear associated with doing activism. I'm not going to say I was completely absent of fear when I first started doing this. But I've got some tips that will help you get over uh, that small anxiety that you get at the start. And the first thing is perspective. Okay, 
And this is what uh, bearing witness gives you. Gives you perspective. Okay? I don't have to explain that any further because we realise, hey, we're not the ones going through it here, are we? Okay? They are, and you know, when, when you go, okay, I feel a bit anxious about this, you go, okay, well, how do they feel? And this is a very powerful thing to do because I do it all the time. Because I still, I still get anxious, you know? I still get anxious. Now, the second uh, thing about that will help you with this fear, okay, is being educated on veganism. Okay, now how does that help you with fear? Because it gives you confidence. Okay, it gives you confidence to speak about this issue. So if you've got a base level of understanding for all the excuses that they give you, Earthling Eats brought out a mad series called 30 Days, 30 Excuses. Okay, now watch them. Watch them. Okay, and you want to be pretty confident because people say something like, you know, oh, what about the animals that die in crop deaths? Vegans kill animals too. You don't know how to respond to that. Okay, you might be a little bit anxious to get in a debate like that. But if you know how to respond, you've got confidence there. Okay, so education. Education is another big key to that. Also, you can remain anonymous as an activist. You know, you don't have to be the face of the SAG movement, the face of social media activism. You can remain completely anonymous. I'll give you an example. Anyone know the page, best video you ever see? Mm -hmm. They've got about 7 million followers. Anyone know who runs that? No. Okay, exactly. How many people do you think they've turned vegan? Maybe. You're getting there. They've got the biggest reach of any... He's got the... Or oh, she. Has got the biggest reach of <laughs> any vegan on earth. Okay? Huge. Huge reach. So, you can remain anonymous. There's many things you can do to remain anonymous. You can work behind the scenes helping other activists that are in, are in the uh, uh, forefront, you know. You're still doing something. People don't need to see your face. You can have an anonymous Facebook or social media page. You know, many different things you can get involved with if the fear is too much for you. Now, I want to talk to you about dealing with criticism, something that I get a lot. I've got a lot of it this week too, you know. I put myself out there a lot. Uh, the media have been, you know, going for it with me, a, a character attacks. Other vegans have been ha coming at me, um, criticising me for speaking up for animals in a certain way. They didn't feel like it uh, did the vegan community good. And I'm getting criticised a bit. And you know, sometimes it does get to you, especially when you've been working really hard and you're so passionate about this and you're really just doing this to, to, for the good of animals. You really, your heart's in the right place. And you know, people criticise you for it. But I'll tell you a little story. So, I come from gangs, okay? I come from gangs and, and doing drugs and hurting people around me, uh, pe leaving my family in fear all the time, okay? I was getting criticised, okay? I turned my life around, I got sober, started helping animals, okay? Trying to create peace, change the world, still getting criticised. So, the point is, you've got to be criticised no matter what you do, so you might as well follow your heart, okay? And this is a very big lesson and something that I had to relearn this week, okay? Because just when I thought that I'm, you know, just really like going really well, bang, something happens and a bunch of criticism. But I, remi I reminded myself of something and Laura helped me remember too, like, wait a second, why are you doing this for? Well, I'm not doing this for vegans. Am I? Do you think the animals are going to criticise me for speaking up on national radio, 7 million people telling them that they're suffering in a gas chamber? Do you think the animals are going to go, oh, you're a bit too abrupt in that interview, um, you know, you shouldn't have spoke with such ferocity about, you know, of course they're not, of course they're not, you know, we've got every single right to be angry about this, okay, now, that's, that's what I, that's my thoughts on criticism, it's going to happen, okay, especially when you start kicking some goals, okay, even the most amazing peaceful activists in the world, James Aspie, Earthling Ed, the most beautiful, placid, polite people you ever meet, so they get criticised like you wouldn't believe, Okay? Now, no matter what you do, you're going to get criticised, okay? So just do what's right. And you know what's right because your heart tells you. Okay, now, is it okay, okay to have nerves? Of course it is. I had nerves when I first started and I still get nerves. Now, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I think it was about my third interview uh, video. I used, to, I used to go out with my little phone and do like street interviews, Joey vs. The Public. It was just my phone and I had a little cord, corded microphone. And... So I was just starting to integrate into society. I was just starting to learn how to socialise without alcohol. I always had substance to, to socialise and stuff like that. So I was going out by myself and I wrote these questions down. Probably very controversial <laughs> questions. I probably wouldn't use that line of questioning now. But back then I was a bit brazen. But I was going out to the city by myself. And I got to the city to do these interviews. I've seen everyone there and I was like, oh, wow. These questions are pretty hectic. <laughs> I don't know how they're going to respond. <laughs> And, I'm, you know, I felt really outside of my comfort zone, so I felt very nervous. 
So I thought, you know what, don't worry about it, just turn back, you know, this is too much, just go home. About to go home and I thought, bang, a penny dropped. And I was like, wait a second, who are you doing this for? And I went, wait a second, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for those dairy slaves that are going to have their children taken off in their whole life and get a knife across their throat when their milk production declines. Okay? Perspective. Okay? And I went and did it anyway. So, which leads me to my next point. My thoughts on courage. Okay? So courage isn't something you are born with. Okay? It's something you build on and you work on. Something that comes from gradually stepping outside of your comfort zone and speaking up. Okay? And your comfort zone might be really small. Okay? And you might step one toe out there and you've still stepped outside of it. Okay? The next day you step outside a little bit further. If my comfort zone is a bit bigger, I can still step outside of that. The point is, you keep pushing the boundaries. Nothing amazing ever happens inside your comfort zone. Okay? Just don't let fear run your life. If I let fear run my life, I would never got where I am today uh, speaking up for animals. And the animals need you now, not next year when you de develop some confidence. Okay? We need you to start stepping outside your comfort zone right now. Courage is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Okay? And it's a liberating feeling doing that. Okay, so my next point is why I feel like it's an obligation to be active once you know the truth. Now, no one can change my mind on this, and I'll tell you exactly why. So veganism is the first step, okay? It's non-participation. You realise you've been causing immense harm, immense suffering with your actions, and you stop, okay? Now, this doesn't make you, Mother Teresa, to realise that you've been causing harm and then stop, okay? It's a non-action. Okay? Now, it's a neutral position, and Martin Luther King said it best, when you're neutral in times of injustice, you've chosen the side of the oppressor. Let me give you an analogy to give you some perspective on this. If there was any other form of injustice happening right in front of your face, let's just put it like this, uh, someone abusing their wife on the side of the road, okay? domestic violence, someone publicly abusing their child, kicking a dog to death in the street, and you've seen that, and you didn't do nothing, what would society say to you? Exactly. You would do something. You would intervene in some way. You would call someone, you would shout out, you would get help. Okay? Why is that any different for farmed animals? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. If you're in the animal's position, would you want someone to help you? Of course you would. And I ask myself that every single day. Animals would save themselves if they could, but they can't. Okay? They're helpless. The only time a, a cow ever fights or gets violent is when she's having her calf taken off of her. Okay? First two times she fights, first two or three times even. But after that she stops fighting. Okay? These are helpless beings. If vegans don't speak up for them, who will? Okay? No one else is. You have the obligation because you know. If, if someone didn't know that child abuse was happening, where's their obligation to speak out about it? But if you've witnessed it, right there in front of your face, we are witnessing people uh, paying for and consuming animal products every second of every day. It's, every, it's everywhere. Okay? You are witnessing an injustice right in front of your eyes. That is where the obligation is. We know. Okay? There comes a time when silence is betrayal. Okay? Another Martin Luther King quote, he said it very well, uh, civil rights movement. Now, if you've got a perfect opportunity to talk about this and you remain silent because you don't want to get that little uncomfortable feeling, You've basically betrayed the animals. Now, I'm not asking you to create a massive scene. I'm, there's polite, tactful, <coughs> respectful, strategic ways to go about this. Okay? Now, that's what I'm, all, all I'm asking. A drop in a card somewhere. Being polite and, and, and maybe asking someone to watch a documentary. In whatever polite, respectful way you want to advocate, we have to do that. Because um, we, the animals need us now. Okay, now I'm going to relieve some of the burden off of your shoulders because I had this burden when I first started advocating and it's that I needed to turn every single individual I spoke to vegan in that one conversation. I don't know if anyone else has felt like that before. Otherwise I thought I was a bad activist or that you know I just wasn't effective. But it's not our job, it's not our responsibility to turn people vegan. Okay? That is not on you, that's on them. Okay? You can give someone the most golden information they've ever heard in their entire life. Okay? Ethics, environment, health, the best, the best evidence for it, and they're still not going to change. Okay? Now they'll change when they're ready. I'll tell you a little something about the 100 point system, and this is a very interesting concept that was uh, created by my friend Omri Paz, he heads an organisation called Vegan Friendly. Uh, Israel's, it's in Israel, and Israel's one of the most, it's the most vegan country on earth. 
Okay, and that's because of the work of some of these activists, along with some other amazing campaigns that happened there. But the 100 point, point system goes like this. Uh, you might be having a conversation with someone, tell them about the dairy industry, bang, you've just dropped 20 points in their mind. They, they might cruise off. A few weeks later, they're scrolling through their Facebook, they see something on the egg industry, bang, Mal, Mal's being ground up alive. Bang, that's another 30 points for them. They're up to 50 points. Okay? They might go out to a vegan restaurant, their friend's there, they ordered the, the vegan burger, and they, they decide to have it too, and they realise it's really delicious. Okay, That's another 25 points. Bang, they're walking down the street, another week later, they see you guys out there doing anonymous for the voiceless outreach. You know, you have a conversation with them, they see the slaughterhouse footage, you give them a card, they decide to do challenge 22. Last 25 points. When they hit the 100 points, they go vegan. Okay, now, you might be that first 20 points to get them started. That might be the only, that might be all they can take at that time. Bang, you've got them started. Okay, or you might be that last 20 points to finish them off. But the point is, you drop your seed. Okay, you, you, you need to be like gardeners, dropping seeds wherever you go. Okay, be a shining light of inspiration. That's the best you can do, okay? You've done your job, essentially, if you do that, okay? And that, that's, we, I see a lot, a lot, it's unsustainable to bang your head against the wall trying to convince somebody who doesn't want to be convinced, especially when it's a family member. Okay, you've, you've tried so hard with them, tried so hard with a friend. You know what you need to do? Go out and do some vegan outreach and, and talk to people who actually want to hear it, okay? And, you know, try your best, exhaust your options, but you need to learn when to make a judgment call and pull away and use that energy that you've got, that light that you've got, to shine on people who are ready to hear the message. So, which brings me to my next point, which is uh, losing hope. Now this happens with a lot with people who I see who have been an activist for a long time, or it can happen with uh, some people who are more empaths and you know, what, what, what's happening to animals really gets to them. They might be getting criticised for their hard work and their effort. They, they might not see the world changing fast enough. I mean, you can imagine being vegan 20 years ago and then, you know, not see anything change until now. I mean, that must be freaking people out that have just seen nothing change. And now it's just like, just growing so much. But th that, that's my point. What I do when I feel like losing hope is just focus on the exponential growth of the movement. Okay, and this is happening right now. Exponential growth. What happens with the snowball effects? It happens really painfully, painfully, slow, 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 and it picks up momentum. And then they give us the internet. <laughs> Bam. Okay, it's exploding now. It is exploding. Ethics is coming to the forefront of the discussion. Okay, and then well, we're on the news now debating with farmers. And okay, and this is what's going to happen. We can't, it's coming to a debate. Okay, and you know who's going to win this debate? The truth. <laughs> okay? No matter how much money they think they've got, no matter how much propaganda they think they can perpetuate, it's going to backfire on them. Because okay? they don't want to bring to the light the most humane slaughterhouse on the planet. Let's put some glass walls up. Okay? Let's see it. They don't want to, it to come to light. So what they're doing is going to backfire on them. But what I'm trying to say is that this movement is growing exponentially and there's more vegan products available. That's because there's more vegans basically creating a demand for it. Okay? There's more of everything uh, vegan. Uh, we marched, 5,000 of us marched uh, last year for Earthling Ed and the Surge Teams um, Animal Rights March. Who came over to the UK for it? To the England for it, sorry? Boom. I want to see you all over there uh, for this year's march. Okay, August 25th. Everyone there. Okay? Now, there's 500 and something thousand vegans in the UK. Okay? And we had 5,000 march with us. 1%. Okay, 1%. Now, let's just say there's 1% vegans in, in the world, and let's just say 1% of those are active. We're still kicking massive goals. Still kicking massive goals. That just goes to show a tiny pinprick of light can brighten a room full of darkness. That's how powerful this, this message is. Okay? We can all change the world. Now, imagine if we got the whole, the whole vegan population out marching with us. Okay? Even just 5% of the vegan population, that's still 25,000 people marching through the streets of London, should have seen what it was like with 5,000 of us. Okay? People looking out the windows, they couldn't even come out of McDonald's, were screaming out the <laughs> They're screaming. It was an amazing feeling. Amazing feeling. Now, this year's going to be even bigger. And it's going to be bigger when we all get up and come for a walk with us. Okay? And show them how powerful this movement is getting. Okay. Brings me up to my next point, which is we're all in this together. Okay? We all need to remember that. I'll tell you a little story. When I was in Bali, um, bearing witness... I decided to bear witness inside of a slaughterhouse. Okay, I'm not saying I don't do workshops to tell people to bear witness inside of slaughterhouses. This could really cripple you. This is something that could really leave you with some trauma. 
But I decided to do it because something told me that I had to. Okay, it came from here and I, and I went and did it. Okay, bear witness to four cows be decapitated, halal style. They, they weren't, um, you know, weren't, they weren't bolt gun. So they suffered for a long time. Their legs were kicking for a long time. There was a lot of blood that was uh, vomiting out of the, the hole that was cutting their neck. They, they looked really innocent and like puppy dogs, okay? It was a, it was a very traumatic experience. Um, it doesn't smell like death in a slaughterhouse. It smells like fear, okay, like struggle. Um, I'll never forget it. But in that moment, obviously, I realised, well, this is not about me at all, is it? Like, there's obviously someone right there that's suffering. It was, I, I made a video, basically, about it, and some vegans seen something that I didn't see, okay? They said, I felt like I'd worked through it, you know, mentally, but they were in the comment section saying, Joel, you know, PTSD can happen a little bit later on, you know, you don't know how, how much this has affected you till later, you know, it's just take a break, have a, take, you know, chill out. I was getting inboxes on Facebook saying, hey, Joel, you want to talk about what you're seeing? I felt like I'd worked through it okay, okay? But the point is, the support was there if I needed it, okay? Because people didn't know how I was really doing. I could have just been saying I was okay. Now, this is true of all of us, okay? You don't know what the vegan next to you is going through, okay? They might, they might have seen something really horrific. They might be really sensitive to the situation. They might be going through something really hard with their family. You know, they might be getting ostracized by their friends. We need to be there to support each other. If you see someone put up a weird status and you just go, hey, you're okay, that could mean the world to someone. That really could. And, you know, the bacon trolls aren't going to be there for you, are they? Who's going to be there for you? We need to be there for each other. Okay, and this, this movement is going to skyrocket when we have that type of solidarity. Okay? We really, it's a really important part of any movement. The biggest threat to any movement is the movement itself. Okay, so we need, let, we need, we need to be less, you know, split apart and more coming together. Okay, so I always finish this with this quote, and I think I always will, because it's a very powerful quote, and it really gives me the fire in my heart to get, to get it happening. It's, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who stand by and watch. So don't be one of those who watch. Let's get out and do something. Thank you very much.